you guys see Eric? I, he, okay, now he's clear. No, but I can see the video, your video on YouTube already. All right. Yeah, it's, it's live already. Okay, welcome. Um, so today is the second week of MLSS 2020. And uh, today's the first speaker is Iwai Te. I will give a brief introduction of him. Dr. Te is a professor of statistical machine learning at the Department of Statistics, um, University of Oxford and a research scientist at DeMind. He obtained his PhD at the University of Toronto and did postdoctoral work at the University of California at Berkeley and the National University of Singapore. He works on statistical machine learning with a particular focus on probabilistic learning, deep learning, meta-learning, Bayesian non-parametrics, variational inference, and Monte Carlo. Today and tomorrow, he will give us a lecture centered around meta-learning, but also covers Bayesian non-parametrics, hierarchical base, probabilistic symmetries, and deep learning. Thank you. Now I'm gonna try this sharing screen thing. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna move my things around a bit. Okay, cool. So um, today I'll be talking about the uh, meta learning um, and I've been kind of working on meta learning the last, I guess, few years, um, uh, initially at DeepMind and then also later on at Oxford as well. Um, and I think I have a kind of a a bit of an idiosyncratic view of meta learning, so that's why I kind of titled this an idiosyncratic tutorial. Um, so I'll start with a bit of a motivation, and then we'll kind of go through some of the um, uh, basics of like uh, optimization-based meta learning and black box meta learning. And then uh, tomorrow I'll be talking about the probabilistic perspective on, on meta learning and how that relates to Bayesian non-parametrics and probabilistic symmetries. Okay, I'll start with some motivation. So um, I think um, in machine learning, um, a lot of the successes has been about using you know, big models and big computers and then running, training your big models uh, on lots of data. Um, but uh, I think going forward, one of the things that's been interesting myself and, and others as well has been on small data problems where you don't have a lot of data. So I'll just like to give a few examples. Um, for example, uh, few shot learning is a problem where, uh, so this is a kind of a visual uh, um, image recognition problem where for your training data, instead of having a th thousands and thousands of training images, you might be shown, let's say one example of five different classes. So these are five different types of, I guess, four different types of dogs and one cat. Um, and based on that small amount of training data, you'd like to uh, um, do something with the system which allows it to make predictions on, on new images. So, so given five training images, you'd like to predict, you know, what are the categories of this five test images, for example. Okay. So, so this is an example of uh, few shot learning. Um, uh, in, in this case, it's a one-shot, uh, five-way classification. Um, and you can see that this is a difficult problem if this is the only data that your system sees. Right? So, and, and then the question is, how do you uh, set up your system such that it has the right inductive biases in order for it to be able to generalize from it, the training set to the test set? Um, another example is recommended systems. This is typically thought about as 
more of a kind of a big data sort of problem where you have lots of users and you have lots of items and you're trying to um, recommend items for users to buy or to see or to watch or something, right? Uh, but another way you could think about recommender systems is that it's actually lots of small data sets. So for each user in your uh, system, uh, there could be um, a small number of movies that the user has watched and has liked, and you'd like to make recommendations based on that small, um, small number of, of movies. Okay. So this is uh, uh, um, myself about 20 years ago, and I was using... I was watching more, I don't know, like science fiction or more like uh, art house type of movies. But uh, and nowadays, I, I think pretty much these are the only things that I watch or more like my children watch. So it, you so you like systems that can kind of make good recommendations for myself 20 years ago or myself now, for example. Okay. Um, another good example of small data problems is in robotics. In robotics, you have a robot that is... Um, trying to learn a new task. And of course you can't, um, if you have a, a real world robot is operating in, in real time. And, and so you, you can't have that many training instances of, for the robot to learn how to solve a new task. Um, there are also other small data problems in robotics. So for example, if you have a simulator that is built for your world and you can, using the simulator train uh, your robotic system um, a lot until it, it does well. But it's always the case that actually the simulation is, is never exactly looking exactly like the real world. Okay. So uh, during test time, uh, you may have um, a very small uh, a number of trials in which you can adapt the robotic system to the real world based on, on its initial training in, in the simulator. Okay, so, th so this is a problem called sim to real. It's a, it's a difficult problem in, in robotics, but one that um, exemplifies, I think, the need for solving small data problems. Okay. And then finally, um, at DMI, we're interested in kind of uh, developing systems that are are generally intelligent. So, and, and typically what we mean, or at least myself, what I, I think of when I think about the general intelligence is systems that can learn quickly uh, from small amounts of data um, and, and can kind of learn to solve things well um, uh, quickly. Okay. Now, of course, that involves even a new situation or a new setting uh, to, to collect only a small amount of data and then to be able to solve it, to solve the problem based on that small, um, small amount of data. Okay, cool. So uh, here's a bit of a, um, um, actually, why is this not playing? Hmm. It's weird, okay. So this uh, GIF should be playing, but somehow it's not playing. Uh, um, anyways, so as I said earlier, um, a lot of machine learning is about kind of churning through lots of lots and lots of data, um, and um, to produce systems that can do well, perform well, make good predictions on on new data. Um, when you have a small amount of of data, then you don't expect your system to do as well as before if you don't add in any other kind of ingredients into your system, okay. and so. Um, if you have a small amount of data, it's important that, that you kind of add additional uh, spices or ingredients, uh, uh, inductive biases into your system in order for it to generalize well. Um, so, and inductive biases can include lots of different types of things. So, for example, uh, pre-processing. So, we could uh, pre-process our data such that it, uh, it looks simpler or that it can, uh, or we can augment our data sets by doing small amounts of translation or rotation, and that kind of in, in effect increases our data sets. We can also do things like feature engineering or maybe choosing right uh, model architectures or maybe doing good regularization for it to do, uh, for it to do well. And I think a lot of inductive biases has been about 
uh, kind of putting um, kind of the system designer uh, thinking about what are important biases that it, that the that the, the designer wants to build into the system, um, and then doing that by hand. So we're actually kind of changing the neural architecture, or we are actually implementing various forms of data augmentation and so forth. And I think of meta learning as actually as a way of not actually using, not um, directly inputting by hand this inductive biases, but rather to actually learn the inductive biases based on uh, kind of based on other data sets that you may have access to that maybe comes from the same domain. Okay, so for example, uh, here we have um, our, our data is coming from uh, kind of handwritten characters and we're trying to kind of, um, we're trying to uh, make predictions on what's the class of, of different characters, uh, of different images uh, in, in this uh, 10 different classes. And you may have um, other data sets of handwritten characters, maybe from different languages or from different scripts. Um, and if you can learn a system based on this other uh, data sets, then, um, and there's kind of variability um, across this handwritten character uh, data sets. And that variability kind of tells you something about the structure of this domain of handwritten characters. And that, that structure is, I guess you could think of it as a form of inductive bias from the perspective of training on this small data set that you have. So, and, um, so I, I tend to think of this as um, the role of meta-learning. Um, there's kind of other names for this process. Another one is called learning to learn because we have a system that, that's trying to learn and we're trying to, um, in a sense, meta-learn a larger system such that this smaller system here on this smaller data set can generalize well. Um, right, um, so that's kind of a bit of a motivation for why I'm interested in doing uh, meta learning. So for the rest of today and tomorrow's tutorial, I will kind of go through some, uh, a few areas of meta learning. Um, um, including uh, optimization based black box probabilistic. And actually, the last section of tomorrow, I'll talk about something that's not about meta learning, but something that was, in a sense, I started exploring, uh, instigated by some of the structures, of some of the neural uh, architectures that people were using for meta learning. Um, right. Um, are there any questions? Good, I guess I, I, guess I can start. Yes. Um, cool, I'll start with optimization perspective, perspective on meta learning. So we'll start with the single task learning first, right? So um, meta learning is about uh, learning from multiple tasks, but let's start with a single task. And it's also important to kind of define what the task is in, in this context, because it can sometimes be a bit confusing. Um, and in, for our setup, I'll just think about a task as simply some data generating distribution. And um, from that data generating distribution, you may have uh, a data set that's split into two halves, a training set and a test set. And the problem for machine learning is given your training set, we would like to be able to learn a predictor, okay? And that, that predictor may have a decision boundary given by this. And what we'd like to do then, of course, is to make sure that our predictor does well, so we can apply it on a test set and we can get some loss, okay? Um, yeah, and we can get some loss like this, and that's a test loss, okay? Um, so for example, um, one of the uh, most popular frameworks for doing machine learning is empirical risk minimization, where we have um, a loss that we're interested in, in minimizing. And we have our um, predictor 
has um, sorry, there's a typo here. So it has is a function that uh, is parameterized by uh, parameter theta. Okay, and this function f of theta takes as input our xi, and it produces a prediction on our output. And this loss function here is measuring the loss in q given that the true target is yi, and the predictor is making that prediction. Okay, and this is the sum over the loss over our over our training set, and we may have some regularizer theta. Okay. And the prob problem of the computation of empirical risk minimization is about minimizing uh, this objective function uh, with respect to our parameters theta. And then given a, a minimizer of theta, we can then evaluate it on our test sets and get a test loss. Um, so that's single task learning. Um, how about multitask learning? So in multitask learning, we have the same setup, um, but instead of a single task, we may have multiple tasks. So from each task, we, here we have three tasks, right? So, and from each task, we have a, a different training set and a different test set. And we're kind of assuming that the training and test sets of this multiple tasks are different, but somehow, uh, related in some way. So they can they may come from the same domain. And so there's some amount of um, sharing that can be done that can, in terms of the learning that can be done. So um, from each task, we may have a different base learner that is, so from each task, we have a different base learner here uh, that's producing a different learns parameter for each of these three tasks. Um, and theta here, I'm going to use to denote um, basically the parameter that's specific to each task. So we have theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. In addition to, to implement this sharing of the um, learning across the tasks, we can think of this, uh, one way to do this is to have a set of parameters which are shared. Okay? So I use uh, um, eta here. And this collection of shared parameters is shared across all the tasks. And so if we learn this, this set of, of shared parameters, then hopefully what we, what we like this, this set of shared parameters to do is to learn whatever that is uh, structure in the tasks that are shared across, um, across all the tasks. Okay. So here our empirical risk minimization now looks like this, where again, we have an inner loss here, which is the sum of the training loss uh, for each of the tasks. And J here is denoting uh, the, the index of the task. And now our function is not just a function of the task specific parameters, theta J, but also the shared parameters, um, eta. And uh, in minimizing all these parameters, we like to minimize over the sum of the tasks of this task specific losses. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, we have regularization for the parameters and we should probably also have a term for regularizing eta as well. Okay. So this is called multitask learning. So we train on the training sets for our three tasks and then we can test on the um, on the predictors across the three tasks, and we might get a different loss for each of our, of, of our tasks. Okay. Okay. Right, so that's just a standard multitask learning. So the difference between, uh, so meta learning is different okay, uh, from multitask learning. Um, and the difference comes in the following way. So um, in multitask learning, our learner is learns to optimize uh, the loss on the training set. Okay. So, so this is what the learner does, right? So the J learner here, a base learner for task J is trying to minimize this average loss for task J. Okay. And you can think of this computation that produces a minimizer of eta J as some function, it's a learner function, okay? that takes as input the training data set for task J and the shared parameter eta, 
and it's kind of minimizing uh, theta j with respect to theta j. Okay. Um, and after the learner has learned its parameters, we then look at its test performance uh, on on the on the test set. Okay. So here I'm using the notation that actually our, our data set consists of n plus m data points. The first n cons, uh, constitutes the training set, and the, the rest of the m items constitutes our test set. Okay. Um, and given the test set, we can evaluate the test performance, and, and this is our test loss uh, based on the learned parameters theta j, the shared parameters eta, and uh, evaluating on our test set. And the aim of better learning is not to learn from the training set, actually, but it's actually to learn to generalize from the training set to the test set. Okay. And the way meta learning works is the following. Um, so given that this is the test loss for our three tasks, okay, what we'd like to do is to optimize our shared parameters such that the test loss across our tasks is minimized. Okay. And we can expand this out a bit. So this is the sum over tasks okay, of the test loss. We can substitute in the functional form for theta j in here. So that's here. Okay. This bit is theta j. And then we can substitute in the functional form for the test loss into this uh, script L. And that's our objective for meta learning. Okay. So it's a sum over tasks, sum over the test set for each task, and then evaluating the loss on the, on the test items based on the predictor where the parameter is given by this learner function is outputted by the base learner. So the idea here is that we want our system to be able to generalize well on, on, on test data, um, given training data. And so the principle that we're using here is the test condition should be the same as our training condition. So in other words, if during test time, uh, we would like a system that can, given a new task, uh, train on its training sets and then generalize well on its, its test set, we should train our system to do exactly the same thing on, uh, on some training tasks. Okay, so, um, so we have our three tasks here, right? And for each of these three tasks, we have a base learner that takes our training set, produces uh, corresponding parameters, and then we can evaluate the predictors on this training tasks on, on the test sets and producing a loss. Um, and then we meta learn our shared parameters uh, of, this, of this system to minimize the test loss. Of course, if you do something like this, then um, we can think of these tasks here as actually training tasks because we're using these tasks to train our system. Um, so, and of course, if you want to evaluate how well does this meta learning system works, we cannot evaluate it on these three tasks anymore, right? Because we're actually, we actually used this, the data that we have about these three tasks, uh, both the training and the test set of these three tasks to, to train our meta learning system. Um, and the training is uh, basically taking the test loss that we have here and we're back propagating and, and actually optimizing uh, eta. Okay. Um, and so to evaluate our meta learning system, we cannot use these three tasks, as I was saying. So we need to evaluate it on a fourth task in this case. Okay. So, and on this fourth task, we may have a different data set, training set from which we get. Uh, we can then train our base learner using the learned shared parameters. Okay? And that produces a predictor 
which we can then evaluate on the test sets uh, and then producing some loss. Um, and um, so um, that's a kind of a bit of a confusing terminology, but uh, when people uh, talk about tasks used for training a meta learning system, those are called meta training tasks. And then the tasks used for evaluating a meta learning system is called meta test task. And in each task, we have split the data into a training set and a test set. Good. Um, any questions about this? Yes, uh, there are some questions. Um, oh, okay. Why learning parameter eta on a test set not correspond to effectively incorporate the test set in the training set? Does this approach separate formally eta and theta and subdivide formally the training set into a first tier training with theta and second tier training with eta? Yes. So that's, yeah, that's, that's right. So it splits the learning into two, two tiers. So there's a base learner that learns the task specific parameters theta. And then there's a second tier, which learns the shared parameters eta. So yeah, the parameter sets are split into two. So there's the task specific parameters and the shared parameter. And the data set is also split as well into the training sets and the test set, okay? So training set here and test set here. And, and that's actually important because, um, actually maybe I should. Um, and it's actually important to split the data into a, a, a training set and a test set because what we would like the base learner to do is uh, to learn on a training set and then to do well on a separate test set, right? So, so we want the base learner to be able to generalize well from a small amount of training sets to new test data, okay? So it's important that the test data that we use to evaluate the base learner uh, is disjoint from the training set we use to train the base learner. So, so this way we can see that the base learner is able to generalize from the training set to the test set. Um, yeah, and the meta learning then is about actually uh, optimizing the, the shared parameters such that this loss here, which is evaluating how well does the base learner generalize from its training set to its test set. Um, and we're actually learning to minimize that generalization loss? Uh, that's a good question. Are, are there other questions? Michelle? Yes, there's one more. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. two more. So Avizid asked, why should we stop at two tiers? What would meta, meta, ML look like? Uh, yeah, you could uh, do that. So um, yeah, you can always do that. So you could, uh, um, so in, in standard meta learning, you think of there being this domain that you're interested in. And within that domain, there might be multiple uh, tasks with multiple data sets. Okay. Um, and and uh, you may have a system that actually is operating across multiple different domains. Okay, so, um, um, and you, you can then imagine that, you know, there's a, some sort of super domain, some sort of hierarchy of domains. You have a super domain and a subdomain, and then within each subdomain, you have multiple tasks. So then you can imagine training this system using some meta, meta learning system. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Okay, next question. Uh, should I go on or do you want to go back? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's good, it's good. Yeah. Okay, according to literature, multitask li Learning usually refers to optimizing more than one loss. That way, however, we add regularization in a single task learning. We are already doing multitasking. 
Would you comment on why we shouldn't differentiate or even emphasize learning multiple real tasks over learning multi multitask with added regularization only? Learning multiple real tasks would definitely take a lot of a lot more efforts. I'm not sure I understand the question. What's the qu question about? Um, so I think there are- What's the uh, distinction between meta-learning and multitask learning? Or is it, it why should we care part. about multiple tasks? Sorry. Yes. That was the first part. So the different differentiating multitask learning from meta-learning. And then mm -hmm. um, the second part was, would you comment on why we shouldn't differentiate or even emphasize learning multiple real tasks over learning multitask with added regularization only. I'm not sure I follow. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first question first. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think in standard multitask learning, um, uh, so in standard multitask learning, we have multiple tasks Okay, and we are training the system only on the training sets, and then we evaluate it on the test sets. So the system is not trained to generalize from its training sets to its test sets. While in meta learning, we do make that distinction, uh, which is that the, the meta learning system is trained to minimize its the test loss corresponding to the training tasks. Mm -hmm. So it actually learns to generalize from the training set to the test set. So that's the distinction between multitask learning and meta-learning. Mm -hmm. um, the second question, I'm not sure I, I kind of got uh, okay. Maybe Maybe let's move on. I mean, we have a okay. uh, round table session, so he can also- Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, that's um, fine. We have more questions, but maybe- uh, It's a good question. So, relevant to these specific uh, slides you just showed. So these, these so maybe we, we go on and then uh, ask these okay. questions. Okay, cool. Right, so, um, so those are very good questions. Thank you. Okay. So um, here's kind of, a, uh, kind of a high level description of how a meta learning system works. Okay. So we have uh, uh, to, as we were saying, uh, two tiers in our learning. So we have an upper tier, which is trying to meta-learn our shared parameters. And then there's an inner tier where uh, given a training task J, we, are, we learn a base learner. Um, and so the, the way this works is in the upper tier, in each iteration, uh, we might pick a training task or maybe a mini batch of training tasks. And for each of these training tasks in our batch, we apply our base learner to output a parameter theta j. And then we can evaluate theta j on the test data for that base learner. And that gives us our test loss. And the meta learner then uh, actually op uh, optimizes the shared parameters by basically, so for example, taking a gradient step, minimize a kind of uh, downhill in this test loss. Um, and then we just repeat the whole process over and over again. Each time we might pick a different training set. Um, right. Okay. Um, and there are lots of different um, data sets that people have uh, applied um, Meta learning systems too. So, um, and I think three of the most popular ones are there's one called Mini ImageNet. Okay, this is originally used for uh, for few short learning, and it's OmniPlot as well. And then there's a uh, meta data set. Okay, so the um, in OmniPlot, basically each data set code is basically is a handwritten character recognition problem. Uh, corresponding to a different script. And in mini image nets, this is a, a data set that's constructed from the larger image net data sets, where there are, each task basically consists of um, 
of um, five categories chosen from, from ImageNet. And in each category, we may only have one or five uh, different training images corresponding to that category. And we'd like to train a system that can take this five or 25 training images and producing a classifier for this five tasks, for, for this five uh, categories and, and, and for it to kind of generalize well to new test images of these five categories. Um, so for both Omniglot and Mini um, ImageNet, you can see that the data sets in both are kind of obtained from, in a sense, the same domain. So in Omniglot, it's just a domain of handwritten characters. In Mini ImageNet, it's kind of the classes in the ImageNet data sets. Um, and metadata sets is kind of a, it's a metadata set in that it's a data set of data sets. So this is a work by um, folks in Google where they've collected a, a, a large number of, of different data sets. And the idea here is that this is a good way of, so if, if for example, uh, you train a meta learning system based on, let's say the first half of this data sets, uh, and then you evaluate the system on the second half of these data sets. So because the data sets are coming from very different domains, the, the, the hope is that um, if a system can do well, uh, generalizing across this uh, vastly different looking um, images across the different domains, then we have meta a uh, general purpose computer vision system. Um, so I, I think a lot of the interest around meta learning is about uh, being able to kind of to generalize well, and even in the case of the data sets, we like to uh, we like to train systems that can not just generalize from a small amount of data for each task, but also generalize across different uh, across different visual domains as well. Right and. Um, Meta learning is a kind of a huge area. It's kind of, it's, there's a huge number of papers out there. I, I cannot follow up on, on everything. So, uh, so the, the tutorial is not, in a sense, um, doesn't cover everything that people know in the literature. Um, and there's lots of different methods that has been proposed for doing meta learning. Okay. And there's uh, lots of different frameworks as well. And today I'll be talking about kind of two, a few of the more popular ones, optimization based and black box meta learning, and as well as a probabilistic view of, of meta learning too. Okay. And in a sense, it's a very vibrant community of uh, uh, meta learning. Uh, and there's lots of different papers out there. And basically all the different papers, a lot of it is about the choice, different choices of base learners and different function classes. And, and this could lead to different methods. And they do all correspond to different inductive biases. Some of these biases are uh, in, kind of motivated by uh, um, uh, more theoretical considerations. So for example, uh, psychological theories uh, of, of categorization, for example, um, or maybe more mathematical theories around uh, asymmetries or invariances, which I'll talk about uh, tomorrow. Okay. And then some of the other choices uh, don't necessarily correspond to inductive biases, but maybe to, to constraints and maybe corresponds to intuitions about what, what works well and what doesn't work well. And some of these con constraints actually have to do with um, kind of maybe implementation issues or hardware issues, for example. Right, so I'll start with optimization-based meta-learning. And in uh, optimization-based meta-learning, uh, it's called optimization-based because we think of the base learner as uh, learning you by optimization. Okay. So for example, the base learner might start with some initial parameters, theta naught, um, and then uh, learn its parameters by running mock over multiple iterations of some uh, gradient descent updates. Okay. So for example, 
uh, in iteration one, we have a mini batch given by x1 uh, and y1, and that forms our gradient uh, with, uh, with rest of our loss okay, uh, based on the current uh, parameter factor. And then that, that gradient then is fed into some update function, okay, which actually produces the update to update our parameter from theta naught to theta one, and we do this multiple times, getting theta two, theta three, and so forth. Okay. So here, um, to note that um, I've kind of dropped the index on task j for simplicity. So we can think of this as um, all of these things should have an index of j so because it's all specific to 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 task j. Okay. Um, and what we'd like to do is um, so the base learner is learning this parameters theta. So and this could be the parameters of a, of a neural network, um, uh, f theta. And meta learning is about adjusting either the initial parameters, uh, in the initialization parameters, or the parameters which produces the update. So for example, things like the, the step size or uh, in the of or the kind of weight decay or momentum terms. So the idea is that we'd like to learn to learn uh, by gradient descent. Right. Um, so here's a, um, there are kind of uh, two papers that kind of started all this. So one by Andri Chovic and then another one at all, uh, and another one by Ravien La Rochelle. Um, and so uh, here's a picture of what I kind of described earlier, okay? So we have a, a base learner, which they call the optimize Z, okay? So the base learner has parameters, theta, at, at, it, at iteration T, uh, the parameters theta T. So uh, given the parameters at that iteration T, uh, the base learner can compute a gradient. Okay, so and delta t here is the is the gradient of the loss uh, on the training a mini batch given by x t and y t. Um, and the gradient is fed into an update function uh, in the uh, optim what they call the optimizer, or you could think of this as the meta learner. Um, so the meta learner has an update function which takes as input the gradient and up and outputs an update which is then added to the parameters. So, so for example, um, um, an an example of such an update is uh, M is uh, is Adam. Okay, so Adam is a popular optimizer. And, and the way it works is that it basically collects statistics having to do with the gradients as well as the element where square of the gradients. Okay. And then it constructs an update uh, using this functional form. Okay. So you can think of all of this here as actually part of this function M, which takes as input a gradient and outputs an update. And the update is then added to the parameters. And then each iteration of the system kind of works like that. And the idea of um, both of these papers is that instead of taking a fixed form for our update function, uh, we can use um, a neural network to learn to convert from a gradient to an update step. Okay. And the idea is that we would like to learn that update function in such a way that our base learner, our base optimizer, uh, can, can generalize well. So we all know that uh, how good a, a machine learning system performs depends crucially on a lot of choices of its hyperparameters, things like the step size or the, or the momentum parameters in, in Adam and so forth. So, um, there's a lot of um, uh, tweaking of this hyperparameters in, 
to make sure that our machine learning system actually does well in the sense that it produces low loss on, on the test sets. Okay. And the idea of this, this thing here is to optimize our optimizer, the, the hyperparameters of our optimizer, such that it can, the output of the system actually produces parameters which, which uh, have low test loss. Okay. Right. Um, something to note here is that for both of these papers, um, uh, in this diagram here, we have a distinction between kind of the, uh, the straight lines and, and the dashed lines. Okay. And the, de the dashed lines basically have a stop gradient on top of them. And the reason for this is because um, the gradients, if you think about this, so the gradient here, right, is the derivative uh, of the loss with respect to the parameters. Uh, and the parameters are a function of the shared parameters uh, in the previous iteration, right? So if we take a gradient, um, uh, if we take a, a gradient, we actually, um, so if we compute the derivative with respect to the shared parameters, that derivative should have, uh, should kind of flow kind of through this dashed lines, okay? So we kind of end up having to compute gradients of gradients, which can be uh, a bit hairy to, to compute, particularly if, if all of these things are on, on neural networks. So, so for both of these papers, they, they just do a stop gradient and, and they just say that, well, uh, we're not going to take gradients through our gradient operator and we just want to learn our, our, our update function uh, such that given those fixed gradients from, from the optimizing, it's kind of, it can uh, generalize well. Okay, so, um, and then there's a, a follow-up paper by uh, Chelsea Finn et uh, al. called MAML, Model Agnostic Method Learning. And in MAML, the idea here is that instead of taking, um, so in this previous work, um, they actually apply this, their system to, to lots of, uh, of gradient update steps. Okay. And so uh, the number of iterations here could be kind of in the order of, of uh, 100 say. Okay. In, in MAML, the idea here is that Instead of actually have, instead of our base learner be uh, applying gradient updates, uh, lots of gradient updates, we just have a base learner do a single update or of very few updates, let's say five, for example. So, um, and um, what we'd like to do is to learn the initialization parameters such that the base learner, even after a single update, can actually generalize well. And it turns out that this is possible, um, which is kind of an, an interesting thing. It's kind of surprising. Um, and in the follow-up paper, they've also shown that actually, uh, this actually doesn't lose expressive power uh, in the base learner, in, uh, in the sense that if your base learner is complex enough, in the sense that the, the neural network is large enough, then a single update actually allows is kind of universal. Okay. Right, so, so here's the way the base learner works. So we have an initialization parameter, which is gonna be our shared parameter. Okay. And the base learner takes a single update step, a single gradient descent update step based on the uh, data, the training data set of the J task. Okay. So theta J is the learned parameter for task J and it is simply taking the initialization parameter uh, and then taking a step downhill in the gradients, just, just one step. Okay. And then we simply meta learn the shared initialization eta um, um, to take, um, to minimize the loss, the test loss corresponding to our tasks. Okay. Um, right. 
And another distinction between mammal and the previous LSTM-based metalunus is that um, we are actually going to take a gradient through the learner gradient step. So we're going to treat this as the actual functional form of that's produced by the base learner. Um, and we're actually, when we compute the gradient with respect to eta, we're actually going to take the derivative through this der derivative operator. Okay. Um, and it turns out that this works better than without. Um, and uh, I'd like to kind of go through a bit of math to, to show you how this thing works. Okay. So this is our base learner, right? So it takes the initialization parameter and it takes a, great, a single gradient step to produce theta j. And the gradients with respect to the shared parameter eta is uh, the derivative with respect to of the test loss, okay, with respect to eta. Uh, and of course, uh, this thing here is the partial derivative with respect to theta j times the derivative of theta j with respect to eta. Okay. Um, this thing here is just the standard gradient that you get applied to the test, to the test set, um, to the loss on the test set. Well, this thing here is a bit more complicated because theta j is of this functional form. So the derivative of this with respect to eta is i coming from this term here, minus epsilon. And then a second derivative, um, which is the Hessian uh, of the, of the, um, sorry, so there's a typo here. So this thing here should be, is this the Hessian of the loss um, on, uh, of the function at initialization evaluated on the training set. So both of this should be xj and yj instead of xjt and yjt, okay. Um, right, and you can see that this derivative, to compute this uh, uh, derivative, there's a product of these two terms. It's the, the gradient is easy to compute, multiplied by some matrix, which is i minus epsilon Hessian. And the difficulty is of course in actually this term here, which is this factor multiplied by the Hessian. Um, and if your uh, a neural network has lots of parameters, it's not just difficult to compute, it's also expensive to compute because you can't necessarily compute the full Hessian and then multiply that by a vector if you have millions of parameters. Okay. But it turns out that actually, uh, this is kind of a, a well-known fact from Autograd. So um, I think the earliest reference I know of in machine learning is actually Bar by Barak Pumata at all in 94. Uh, but apparently it dates from even before that. Okay. So it turns out that it's possible to compute vector Hessian products in linear time. So in, uh, in, a, uh, in a, an amount of time that it, um, it takes to, com to kind of back propagate, to compute uh, a gradient, you can actually compute uh, the product between a grade, between some vector and the Hessian through a, a, a neural network. Um, it's a little bit involved, and you can take a look at um, at uh, relevant papers uh, to to see this. So, so what we see is that um, to train a mammal, we do a forward pass to get the uh, the to uh, evaluate our function, our base learner function on the on its inputs. We can do a backward pass to update our parameters. And we do another pass to compute this vector has in product. And that gives us an update to our shared parameters eta. Um, so that's MAML. Um, any questions about this section? Um, so we got some questions, but not necessarily about this section. Um, okay. Should I go on or? Um, um, maybe, let me see. Um, maybe I'll finish this 
this bit and then uh, and then uh, we can kind of take some questions. Okay. okay. Right. So um, right. So just a bit of a recap for optimization best uh, based uh, method learning. So as we say, there's kind of two tiers of this. So we have an inner tier, which is the optimization assisted with the base learner. And then we have an upper tier, which is uh, assisted with meta learning, the shared parameters of our meta learning system. So this is um, some of the good things about, about this is it's very flexible. It's applicable to a wide range of, of, of uh, neural architectures. Uh, so this is kind of, that's why um, uh, this is called meta model agnostic meta learning in the sense that it doesn't really care what the base learner's architecture is. It, so long as you can take a gradient through the base learner and you can take and you can compute uh, this vector has in product, then, then you're good to go. Okay, so it's flexible, you can apply it to lots of different types of base learning architectures. Another good thing about optimization based meta learning is that there's, uh, in a sense, an inductive bias which says that um, even without, um, so you could initialize your meta learning parameters uh, such that even without meta learning, the base learner is doing something sensible. It's actually doing gradient-based learning, right? So, so by default, the meta learning, the base learner will already be doing reasonably well, and the meta learning kind of improves on that in a sense. Okay? So, in a sense, the inductive bias here is we start with a uh, with a base learner that's already doing well. Uh, however, there are kind of different challenges. Uh, difficulties associated with optimization-based uh, meta learning. Uh, it can be quite sensitive to the architecture, the neural architecture. So, in the sense that the met the meta learning can be um, uh, um, can be unstable, uh, depending on the choice of the of the base learning architecture, and it can be quite expensive too. Even if the vector has in products takes linear time, it, it's still um, you might still need lots of meta learning iterations, um, and um, and the computation of a vector has in product can still be quite expensive. Um, in the sense that you actually need to keep, um, if your base learner does ten iterations, you actually need to unroll your base learner through kind of ten different. Um, so you actually need to kind of have ten different copies of the base learners. A neural network in memory. So it's kind of expensive in terms of the amount of memory that you need. Okay. Um, right. Uh, there's also kind of difficulties of this approaches uh, in terms of back pro backpropagating through many base learner iterations. So you can see this in the um, learning to learn by gradient descent by gradient descent works. Um, in that if you unroll this, it looks like a recurrent neural network. And we are evaluating the base learner only on the last iteration of the parameters, then it's difficult to actually do that optimization and the computing the gradient across the whole uh, uh, recurrent neural, uh, neural network. Okay. Um, so in the um, um, learning to learn and the LSTM meta learning papers, what they do is they actually evaluate the test loss on each iteration of the unroll uh, base learner so that you can you get more gradients out. Okay. Uh, alternatively, um, if the base learner optimization can be analytically solved, then the gradients can be computed exactly. Okay. So there's this uh, recent papers in Harrison et al. Um, we, they only meta learn the last layer of of the neural network. And so, uh, and in fact, if you apply this to uh, regression, so, and you're only learning the last layer, you can actually compute, uh, if you take a Bayesian approach, you can actually compute the Bayesian posterior exactly. Um, and then you can actually uh, compute the exact gradient through the whole thing. Easily. In Lee et al., uh, they in replace this last layer of a neural network with an SVM which can be solved exactly and quickly, and, and gradients can be computed through the SVM. 
Uh, alternatively, there's a recent paper also by Josephine's group et al, which uses the implicit function theorem to actually compute the necessary gradient with respect to the shared parameters. Okay. That's uh, uh, quite a nice idea. Medium, you said there were some questions? Yes, uh, we have one question who wants to ask directly to you. So. Okay, I guess uh, he's, he's not here. Mm. Okay, we have many other questions. I will ask, what should I start with? Um, okay, let's start with a quick one. What are the differences between transfer learning and meta-learning? Um, I think of transfer learning as a broader problem um, in the sense that uh, anything that involves transferring from one task to another task uh, or maybe one domain to another domain, I think of that as transfer learning. Um, and it's kind of a broader pro thing in, in the sense that it is a problem as opposed to a framework. Uh, as opposed to a methodology, okay? so in the sense that uh, it's a problem of how do you do transfer? How do you kind of get machine learning systems that can transfer well from one problem to another problem? Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different things that you could do there. You could do pre-training and fine tuning. You could do, uh, uh, you could do um, uh, multitask learning, you could do meta learning. So, but it, uh, so that's kind of a larger problem. Um, and, and some of this could be very different where the, where the two, the, um, the problem that you're trying to transfer from and to, to can be very different. Well, I think of meta learning as a particular approach that can achieve transfer by actually learning to, uh, to, to generalize from a training set to a test set of, of the training tasks. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so people like coder inference a lot, so this is related to coder inference. To what extent do you think coder inference has a role to play in meta learning? Learning coder relations. What, 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 what inference? To what extent coder inference? Code inference. Coder causality. Causal. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. To what extent do you think causal inference has a role to play in meta learning? Learning causal relationships would seem to pair well with making strong predictions from small context sets. Uh, I think it would be interesting if we could do it. Uh, um, I don't know of works that use causal inference within the context of meta learning. I know of works that actually try to learn. Um, make causal predictions using meta-learning. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but you know, it's such a large literature that I wouldn't be surprised if there were works that actually tries to do causal inference for doing good meta-learning, it's possible. All right. Okay, uh, what are the assumptions made on the relatedness between meta-learning tasks? Does it guarantee that the performance of the system will improve as we add more and more meta learning, meta training tasks? Um, in theory, yes. So it's a good question. So the relatedness among the tasks is very important in meta learning. So, um, and that's kind of one of the issues that uh, was why um, uh, the meta. Uh, meta data sets was proposed as a kind of data set for meta learning. So um, just as machine learning systems, you don't expect it to be able to kind of generalize very far away from your training sets. Meta learning systems, you don't expect it to generalize very far away from the meta training sets okay, of meta tasks. Uh, meta training tasks. Um, um, and so, and some of the earlier meta, uh, some of the earlier data sets that people used for meta learning, so Omniglot and mini, mini, uh, mini image nets, uh, turns out that uh, even though it looks quite diverse, it's not diverse enough. 
So in that sense, uh, um, um, the system only learns to generalize within those domains. Um, and, and that's why the metadata set was proposed so that you can get much more diverse meta training so you, so you can get much better uh, meta learning out. So that, I think that was the first part and then I kind of forgot the second part of the question. Um, so the, the performance uh, of the system improves as you add more and more meta training tasks. Right, right. Um, in theory, yes. So you know, if you can add more meta training tasks, that's always a good thing. So ju just as in machine learning systems, if you can have more data, that's always a good thing. Uh, but there are complications um, having to do with kind of learning, learnability issues. So sometimes when the tasks, when there's lots of different tasks and the tasks look very different from each other, there could be interference across tasks where uh, basically if you learn on one task, then that actually could disrupt the learning on the second task. Okay. Um, and so, and this is actually particularly severe in a case of reinforcement learning, because if you learn on one environment, uh, and then you try to transfer that to a second environment, uh, what could happen is that uh, the policy that does well on the first environment could actually be catastrophic for the second environment because it's not able to explore well in the second environment once it has adapted to the first one. So it actually can destroy the learning uh, in, in, this, in the second environment. Okay. So, and even out of a reinforcement learning context, even if you look at pure supervised learning, there are kind of interference, kind of gradient interference that happens. And this is kind of a, quite an active area of research that people are trying to kind of understand when this task interference happens. We still have two, three more questions. Do you want to continue um, or you want to go back to the slides and then we um, have about 20 minutes left uh, until okay, the end. Okay. So, so maybe I should try to kind of go to the, the next uh, section. Okay. okay. So um, in the previous section, we talked about optimization based meta learning where the base learner is some optimization algorithm. Right? So that, let's say minimizes empirical risk or something. However, not all learning algorithms are optimization based. So for example, we could do K nearest neighbors, right? Where the base learner would simply memorize the training set and then at test time actually match the test inputs with the training inputs in memory to make predictions. Okay. Um, and black box meta learning is basically uh, methods which actually implements this base learner using some uh, a differentiable programming framework using a, a neural network that basically directly outputs this these predictions and then is, if it's implemented by a neural network then we can actually take uh, back propagate gradients uh, through the base learner to update the parameters kind of the shared parameters. So I'd like to kind of highlight a few uh, of the more uh, um, popular black box meta learning systems. So the first one is called matching nets. This is one of the early ones. So, and it's effectively a softened one nearest neighbor classifier as the base learner. Okay. And the way it works is the following. So this is applies specifically to few short image classification, but you could generalize this to different uh, classification problems. So you have your meta training set, which consists of, let's say four images of dogs, as well as a corresponding label. So this is the class that, uh, the, I guess, different types of dogs, I guess. Um, and this is uh, visualized in terms of the color of this little square. Okay. So this is your training set. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take each image and re rather than doing uh, uh, measuring distances in pixel space, we embed each image into some, some 
high dimensional but still but still uh, some high dimensional vector space. Okay. So we take each image and pass it through a neural network which outputs a vector. And we do this for each of the training images that we, that basically um, uh, embeds each xi into g. Some this is some neural network param parameterized by eta of xi. And similarly, given a test image, we might embed uh, this test image into the same space as well. Okay, uh, and we can use a different uh, neural network to, to do this, or we can use the same one. Okay, so in this case, we use a different one. We take each test input xi and we map it through another neural network f eta. Okay. Um, and then we simply say that the probability that um, that this test image belongs to, uh, let's say the blue class is going to be uh, basically taking e to the dot product in this of these two embeddings. Okay. And then we normalize this. And that's going to be the probability that this test image belongs to the same class as, as that. As, as that training image. And we do this for each of the training images. So this probability is sum to one. And basically this gives us the, uh, the prediction of the test image belonging to each of these four training classes. Okay. Um, so that's the description for the base learner. And we simply uh, optimize uh, the, the, the parameters eta um, of this thing. Okay, so so we evaluate uh, this thing. We evaluate. We can compute the loss on this test image uh, given the true label, and then we just back propagate through the whole thing. So in a sense, it's just we've reduced a meta learning problem into a supervised learning problem, where the where now the the neural network actually takes as input lots of images. We have a test data set and a uh, sorry, training data set and a test data set and we back properly and we compute a loss uh, based on the output of this neural network and then we just back properly through the whole thing. Okay. Um, you can think of this as a memory-based meta-learning in the sense that uh, we take the training images and we embed them into vectors and then we are storing this in memory so in, uh, in terms of activations of the, of the neural network. You can also think of this as metric-based meta-learning as well because we're actually embedding the training and test inputs into some, some metric space and then we're actually uh, evaluating distance in, of these embeddings in this metric space. So in this case, we're actually taking a dot product, but, but we can also do things like uh, square L2 distance in this embedding space, for example. Um, right. Um, um, so another example uh, is called prototypical networks, where we can do a similar thing. So, but instead of using uh, one nearest neighbor classifier, we Kind of form prototypes one for each class. So we take each training input, we map, we embed it into, into our space. So each of these circles here are going to be uh, the embeddings of our training inputs. And then instead of doing one nearest neighbor classifier, we're actually going to form prototypes one for each class. Okay. So CK here is simply going to be the average of the embeddings of the training images. Uh, belonging to class K. Okay, so we just take the embeddings and we just average them together. And that's going to form the prototype in this embedding space. And then we can just predict by saying that the probability that a test image uh, belongs to class K as uh, given by this prob So this is the probability that's given. Okay, so we just simply take Met, uh, so we take our test image, we, have, we embed it into the same space, and then we're simply going to measure distances to each of the uh, class prototypes, and then take e to the minus square distance divided by some 
parameter the sigma square, and then we just normalize that, and that gives us the properties of belonging to each of the of the of the classes. Okay. Um, and the whole thing is differentiable, and you can gain back properly through the whole thing. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, another uh, approach that one can take is a kind of a more um, computational approach where um, um, instead of kind of doing this thing where we specify a particular form for the base learner, we're actually going to allow the base learner to be some arbitrarily potentially complicated uh, computation, okay? So the idea is that what the base learner does is it's given a sequence of training of input-output pairs, and it's simply going to ingest that sequence using a, a neural Turing machine with some external memory. So this is kind of the neural uh, uh, Turing machine. It At each iteration, it looks at the... Uh, it's given uh, an input image. And so, yeah, so at each iteration is given an, an input image. It's asked to make a prediction as to which class it belongs to. And then it's told the real class. Um, and then given that pair, it can then store that in its external memory because it's kind of, it's a, it's a two machine. And then we kind of iterate this. So at each iteration, it's given a, an input image. It makes a prediction. It incurs a loss. And then it's given the true label. It stores that in memory. And it goes on to the next input-output pair. Okay. And then the loss is simply the, the, the sum of the losses across the iterations um, that it, that it, that it uh, incurs. And then the whole thing is differentiable because it's a neural uh, a Turing machine, and we just backpropagate through the whole thing. Okay. Um, so here's a, another example of a, back, of a black box meta learner. It's called SNAIL. It's a simple neural attentive learner. So the idea here is that it's very simple. We, we, our data set consists of input-output pairs, and it simply treats the base learner problem as a sequential prediction problem, where it takes the previous input output pairs and the current input uh, image, and it simply produces a prediction uh, a label that it then incurs a loss on given the true label of that of the current input. Okay, and this is a, a standard sequential um, prediction problem. You can use a recurrent neural network, or in their case, they use a combination of a causal convolution and attention layers. Okay. Um, so in a sense, um, I kind of went through the different architectures pretty quickly, because in a sense, if you've seen one of these black box meta learning systems, you've seen them all, right? So all of them involve taking a training data set, uh, pass this through a neural network. This could be a recurrent neural network. It could be uh, some sort of, um, attention, self-attention uh, modules. It could be other sorts of things that produces some task representation. And then based on that, and you can think of this task representation as summarizing our training set in some way. Okay. Um, and then that along with a test input uh, uh, that is fed into another part of the system, which then makes a prediction on the label or the output that's needed given that test, given that test input and given the training set. Okay. And the whole thing is differentiable and, uh, and we just can evaluate the test loss on this, um, of, on the prediction given by the base learner and we just backpropagate through to learn the shared parameters given by, by EDA. Okay. Right. Um, so here's a bit of a summary for black box uh, meta learning. So it effectively, as I said in the, on the previous slide, it, we just learn some differentiable function 
which maps from our training data sets to some test predictions. It's very simple as a framework. It reduces effectively meta-learning back to supervised learning. And of course, it's broad and flexible that you can apply any sort of uh, deep learning architecture or maybe it, or, or also non-deep learning sort of things you could apply SVMs or Gaussian processes to this thing as well. It's just, uh, in a sense, su supervised learning. Okay. Um, in terms of challenges, it kind of tends to be harder to learn this black box architectures uh, because the, the base learner has no inductive bias to learn on its training sets, right? Because in the optimization-based methods, the base learner defaults to actually optimizing, uh, minimizing the empirical risk on its training set. Okay. Well, in this case, the base learner could default to, to doing something completely arbitrary. So it's kind of harder for it to learn to um, optimize on its training set. Um, and as a result, it's less able to generalize out of the meta training distribution. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it kind of generalizes less well in a sense. Okay. Um, I think uh, that's actually kind of it for black box meta learning. But uh, um, before I finish up, I'd like to kind of just touch upon one last thing. So, if you get back to the previous slides, we have this is the architecture for our black box meta learning system. It takes as input some training data, and then there's another separate input, which is the test data, and it makes a prediction based on it. If you think about a standard machine learning setup, we're kind of assuming that our data is IID. Okay. So the question is, if our data is IID, then the what we like our base learner architecture to do is to make sure that if we if we permit the the order in which we show our base learner, uh, uh, so if we permit the order of the training data set, that shouldn't change the prediction of the base learner. Okay, so that's in a sense an inductive bias having to do with the fact that our training data set is drawn ID from some task generating distribution. And that IIDness turns into uh, invariance with respect to permutation of that training set. Um, right, so assuming that our data items within each task are IID, the learner function should be invariant to permutations of the training set. And what, and what that means is that if you look at the learner function, so this is the bit that outputs theta, it takes as input uh, a, a training data set uh, and if we permute the order here, so pi here is a permutation, and we just reorder our training sets, the output of the learner should not change. Yeah. And you can look at, and in a sense, this is a sensible inductive bias having to do with the assumption that our data is IID. Um, if you look at uh, some of these uh, meta learning systems that we've seen, some of them actually have this inductive bias, and some of them don't. So like mammal and prototypical networks and there's this simpler version of, of matching nets that I've just uh, described actually have this inductive bias. If you reorder the training set, it actually doesn't change the prediction. But uh, the LSTM meta learner and things like man and snail uh, actually treat the data as coming in sequence and it's actually processing them using some recurrent neural network or using some convolutional uh, causal convolution uh, layers. So they are actually not permutation invariants. So in uh, tomorrow, uh, I think I'll talk about, uh, in the last bit of the tutorial, I'll talk about how do we choose neural architectures for permutation invariants. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, I think I have four minutes left and we can take questions. I think. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Um, okay. Can you still apply meta-learning techniques without the labels of the test set, as in domain adaptation case? Um, the framework that I've just described for meta-learning, it wouldn't be possible to, to train them 
without test labels because the uh, it's actually optimized for minimizing test loss and to actually compute the test loss, you need the test labels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you recommend any literature on the theory of meta-learning? What are the main theoretical problems, for instance, from optimization viewpoint in this area? Um, I don't know about the optimization viewpoints, but there are interesting learning theories or questions that uh, comes out from meta-learning. Um, it's not currently explored that much, I think. But like, there's actually some older work by um, Jonathan Baxter, where he looked at kind of a learning theory of meta-learning uh, that was from the 80s. And it's interesting because it's different from standard learning theory. In, in standard learning theory, you're given a training set. And what you like to do is to, to think about, uh, can you bound the generalization area, uh, the generalization error uh, based on this training set of size M? And you can look at how does that gen bound on the generalization loss? Uh, how does that vary with N? Okay. In meta learning, you don't just have a size of the training set that you that that um, that you think about in terms of generalization error. You also need to think about the number of training tasks, right? So the generalization isn't just in terms of generalizing from the training to the test set of each task, but also generalizing from the meta training set to a meta test set. So that's kind of two things that you need to vary. The number of tasks that you're training on and the, and, and the, and the number of uh, training items within each task. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's quite an interesting problem. I, I don't know whether the, the kind of learning theory that Jonathan Baxter did back then has become, in a sense, updated using current techniques in learning theory. So that would be an interesting thing to explore. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in your slides, I think one of them had, a, you introduced the data sets for ML, in, in ML uh, field, we, we have these data sets, um, mostly image classification focused. Mm -hmm. um, how prevalent is meta learning in other domains aside uh, from meta RL? Mm -hmm. um, it can be used. Um, I think that meta learning can be quite useful in terms of user adaptation. Um, so I think the recommender system is an example where, in a sense, you know, your Netflix or Amazon Prime, and then you know you have lots of users and um, and what you'd like to do is given the small amount of training, small amount of data that we have associated with a particular user, how do you adapt and make good recommendations for the user, right? Um, I think that uh, one can do meta learning in those sorts of situations. Uh, you can also imagine if you have some sort of uh, personal assistant smart speaker system, uh, you might want to, to adapt your speech recognition to the person or maybe to the environment that the speaker is, is, is located in, like in terms of reducing, um, adapting to the uh, sound, soundscape of the, of, the, of the room that the speaker is in, for example. So I think those things one can do meta learning because you want to adapt very quickly to, to your, your user, for instance. Right. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, we will see each other uh, at the roundtable session uh, scheduled in 30 minutes. Okay. Cool. Thank, thank you. you.